My name is Harold Furch, Scott Roth, here at the Hudson Institute and the Center for the Economics of the Internet. Today we're going to be discussing an important topic uh, involving space and space debris, and how do we coordinate among all of the different constellations of satellites and all of the other satellites that are in space. We have with us today, uh, we're very fortunate to have Commissioner Nathan Symington of the Federal Communications Commission. Commissioner Symington has focused on space issues and uh, has, has been one of the great thought leaders on this very topic here at the Commission and in Washington. Uh, he will give an address. In following the address, we are fortunate to have a distinguished panel of experts on space to discuss Commissioner Symington's talk, as well as discuss the general topic of space debris and how, how to deal with it. I will introduce the panel after Commissioner Symington's talk. But first, let me welcome Commissioner Symington. Commissioner Symington has been a commissioner of the FCC for over three years and has brought with him a wealth of experience both in the public sector and the private sector. He's been a thought leader here at the Commission on a wide range of issues and has uh, focused a great deal on space topics. Indeed, his entire staff has been focusing on this and has uh, put this program together, I must say. We're very fortunate to have Commissioner Symington speak on this topic, and I'd like to welcome you, Commissioner Symington, here to, uh, to the Hudson Institute to discuss this. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Fershgott Roth, and uh, of course I'd like to thank you and the Hudson Institute for hosting this event and express my gratitude as well uh, to the distinguished panelists for joining today. I'll try to keep my remarks brief, but sadly I'll probably fail, so please bear with me. Thomas Kuhn, in the classic The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, advances the ideas of normal science and paradigmatic change as explanations for scientific revolution. Normal science, says Kuhn, is where scientists working in a field labor on well-defined problems that are continuous with and understood by others in their field of study. There exists, within normal science, consensus around the basic concepts that are the subject of study, the physical, or in some cases, social mechanisms that drive observed behavior. Scientists do their experimental work in a way that more or less accords with a the theory of the world shared by others in their scientific domain. But, says Kuhn further, from time to time, there comes a revolution in scientific understanding, a fully new model of the world that explains most or all of the same observational phenomena observed by those currently doing normal science, but does so in a way that may not merely slightly misalign with prior understanding, but indeed overturn it completely. A new paradigm emerges from the chrysalis of the old, a fully new creature. I choose this metaphor specifically. You see, a caterpillar does not merely grow wings within a chrysalis or some such. A caterpillar within a chrysalis is fully liquid. If you cut it open at the right stage, caterpillar soup pours out. A caterpillar digests itself to form a fully new creature with fully new structures. The same DNA, the same physical substrate, yields an entirely different insect. Kuhn's most cited example of a scientific revolution, one apt for the subject of today's discussion, is the Copernican Revolution. Please excuse me for simplifying, as I'm sure I'll miss some important details, but the Copernican Revolution had essentially the following contour. Prior to Copernicus, astronomers believed in the geocentric or Ptolemaic model of the heavens. I understand there's uh, some dispute as to whether and to what extent this belief was widely held, and indeed it appears evident that relatively sophisticated heliocentric models of our local universe existed contemporaneously with the Ptolemaic system. I'm a mere regulator and not a historian of science, so Ptolemy it is for today. The Ptolemaic model, to explain the revolution of heavenly bodies around the Earth, required epicycles, a smaller revolutionary transit around a fixed point within the larger wheel of planetary revolutions around the Earth, much like a planetary gear system does in machinery today. In the Ptolemaic system, a planet revolves not around the Earth as such, but around a point which itself is revolving around the Earth. Without the epicycle, observed planetary motion was basically inexplicable, because sometimes planets appeared to move backward. The trick is, however, that with the epicycle, planetary motion was largely explicable, mostly understood, but there were some issues, a few evidential anomalies, and those anomalies began to stack. What do you do with anomalies? While the Ptolemaic system actually was itself a refinement of a prior geocentric planetary model attributed to Hipparchus, who had predated Ptolemy by a couple of centuries, and indeed to whom Ptolemy himself had credited his own initial understanding of planetary motion. The Ptolemaic system, while relying on the same basic conceptual priors, nevertheless posited refinements here and there that better explained observational data. The Ptolemaic system was therefore evolutionary rather than revolutionary. But what do you do when you take a scientific model of the world as far as it seems suited to go, and you're left with an unaccountable pile of experimental or observational anomalies when you can no longer refine your model? Then comes a revolution. I might here have said step change in understanding, but that isn't quite right because you aren't even on the same graph. You're in a fully new domain. 
And maybe you diagonalize your observational results into this domain, and you find that not just are well-understood results amply accommodated, but the anomalies are too. Of course, I'm skipping a step here. Why do some people break with the past to dream up the new concept, and under what conditions is the new concept dreamt up? If we had a model for that, I think we'd be living in a very different world. I'll simply offer the probably uh, semi-apocryphal account of how August Kekulé came up with his idea for the structure of the benzene molecule. That is, he dreamt of a snake eating its own tail, and when he awoke, realized that benzene had to be a ring, creating the immensely productive ideas of ring-shaped aromatic hydrocarbons and molecular resonance. So in other words, he quite literally dreamt it up. So you can take that for whatever it's worth. However the revolution comes, it comes, and real progress once again becomes possible. The anomalies have begun to stack, in my view, in telecom regulation. The conceptual priors upon which normal regulation has proceeded um, from time to time have nonetheless been called into question today. Consider that when the FCC was formed by the 1934 Communications Act, spectrum was ample and essentially free. Interference, at least subsequent to bound allocation and licensure, initially introduced in 1912 and evolved disconnected. In 1927, by the Radio Act, was functionally a non-issue. Folks, I think we have to pause. Yeah. I hope we can splice back in. I'll run back about a paragraph. Yeah. I don't know a better way of dealing with this, I'm afraid. So <clears throat> consider that when the FCC was formed by the 1934 Communications Act, spectrum was ample and essentially free. Interference, at least subsequent to bound allocation and licensure, initially introduced in 1912 and evolved in 1927 by the Radio Act, was functionally a non-issue. The telephone was a nascent technology. Commercial radio had been around for just over a decade, and television, at least as a commercial product, did not yet exist. And throughout the subsequent decades, the Commission and Congress together refined the application of the Act as the conditions on the ground, let's call them the material conditions, began to change. And by 1996, at the dawn of the so-called information age, enough material conditions had changed so as to require an evolutionary step. And so the Telecommunications Act of 96 was passed, which included, among other things, and for the first time, explicit treatment of information services. Times have changed a bit more rapidly between 1996 and 2023, largely due to the explosion of those same information services than they did between 1934 and 1996. And at least from where I sit, the anomalies have once again started to stack. It's not clear to me, for instance, that the singular focus on regulation of transmission rather than reception in spectrum accommodates everything we needed to do, or that the Commission, once it has confirmed that RF emitting equipment, so long as it operates with the constraints of its factory software and license, should or must sit on its hands with regard to the security of that device, or that the media marketplace is actually an archipelago of different modes of transmission rather than a single regulatory continent. Acunian might say, something's going to happen. Whether that something is revolutionary or what is much more likely evolutionary is a matter for Congress, but indeed something at some point soon has to give. Because while the Commission has within its remit a few regulatory levers to pull to address some of the material conditions before it, some refinement of the underlying bases for authority, that is to say the statutory equivalent of our conceptual priors, is probably in order. And yet, having set the stage of regulatory evolution, I also believe that the Commission has before it a compelling regulatory opportunity, one for which, at least to my mind, it is well poised to address with existing authority, one by which it can accelerate the growth of a sector that promises itself its own evolution or even revolution in commercial and industrial applications, and one in which the Commission can help America secure itself as the world leader of what is among the most exciting areas of technological and economic growth in generations. Our next regulatory evolution, unlike the Ptolemaic model, is not geocentric, it's leocentric. Not unlike the Commission's other regulatory domains, however, the conceptual priors informing the Commission's authority have begun to admit of anomalies in the material operating conditions. The Commission's existing satellite authority was born in a different era, an era of sparse, high, long-lived and heavy satellites launched by state actors to accomplish fundamentally dual-use objectives. And while satellites may have intrinsic dual-use aspects, the complexion of the marketplace has otherwise shifted. The future, and indeed the present, is massive constellations of hundreds or thousands of comparatively low-orbiting, short-lived and small satellites with principally commercial applications. There are tens of thousands of satellites in the Commission's approval pipeline alone to say nothing of those in other countries. And what once was a tertiary or lower concern regarding, or regarding orbital debris generated by satellites or launch vehicles has become an urgent, significant consideration for every satellite operator, to say nothing of human spaceflight, 
A revolution in orbital debris mitigation, therefore, may in fact be merely a reasonable evolutionary step in addressing the revolution in material conditions of satellite operation. Here, too, the anomalies have begun to stack. Starlink alone has engaged in at least 1,700 publicly reported avoidance maneuvers in response to the debris squall generated by a single recent Russian anti-satellite or ASAT test. Chinese rocket bodies have hit the moon, and what's far worse, have fallen uncontrolled into international airspace. Some accidents will no doubt happen at the birth of any industry, despite the best intentions. Optimal safety may not be perfect safety, but what we must avoid, and what grows more likely in a massively populated, yet largely unregulated space environment, is calamity. The new space age is upon us, and to both potentiate transformative economic value and prevent irretrievable loss of human and scientific value, it must occasion a revolution in regulatory thinking. Having waxed philosophical at some length, let me now speak plainly. America should lead the space economy, period. We have something like half of the customers of the existing satellite marketplace. We have many of the dominant commercial satellite operators domiciled within the United States. And while the space economy is intrinsically international for the literally physical reasons of satellite transit, the United States is set up with a regulatory hook, as it were, as few other jurisdictions are. And we can use that hook like a debris removal tug to pull the market along to where it needs to go. So let me explain how we can get there in three ways. First. I strongly encourage Congress to adopt the SAT Streamlining Act. This bipartisan bill requires the Commission to clear its own log jams in the processing of satellite license applications and modifications by setting shot clocks on Commission decision-making in all significant aspects of Commission satellite processing activity. It further provides fast lanes for the grant of certain license modifications. It limits the amount of information provided to the Commission by satellite operators to only that which is essential to inform a Commission determination. And it requires the Commission to adopt a thoroughgoing framework for orbital debris mitigation for satellites that is harmonized with a whole-of-government approach, while still leaving the Commission freedom to adopt additional standards that are consistent with existing practices adopted by the Secretary of Commerce, which would, in all likelihood, be NASA's orbital debris mitigation standard practices. The Commission chairwoman took a bold step in the creation of the Space Bureau. She was right to do it. But for the SAT Streamlining Act to be a success and to catalyze the world space economy through American leadership, it must be paired with a formal congressional expansion of Space Bureau resources. The Commission has 1,500 employees to oversee something like one-sixth of the American economy. By contrast, the Department of Agriculture has something like 100,000. The Commission needs at least one, an additional 100 full-time employees, mostly engineers, in the Space Bureau if we are to deliver on the transformative promise the SAT Streamlining Act puts before us. Without greater resources to process the unprecedented number of complex satellite license and market access applications, we risk worsening the status quo ante, albeit with greater consternation on the part of operators already forced to race to the regulatory bottom and fly flags of convenience. To succeed in contending with orbital debris, the Commission must first succeed in processing applications. Second, the Commission should push toward market access and license equilibration in the mitigation of orbital debris. The situation at the Commission right now is that while U.S. licensed operators are subject to direct Commission oversight when it comes to filing their orbital debris mitigation plans, foreign licensed operators seeking market access may file an orbital debris mitigation plan that is, quote, subject to direct and effective regulatory oversight, unquote, by another country's licensing authority and thereby have its plan deemed adequate. The Commission must state and the record supports that any satellite operator that points a telecom satellite at a U.S. Earth station should be subject to exactly the same orbital debris mitigation rules. The Commission simply cannot rely on comity with other jurisdictions with less or no skin in the game, nor should it incentivize races to the bottom, nor can or should the Commission independently evaluate the practices of all regulatory authorities of other potential jurisdictions. Instead, the Commission should provide clear regulatory certainty that its rules apply to all operators seeking access to the robust and, for, for now, perhaps even indispensable American satellite consumer market. By this single move, the Commission could provide a very strong incentive for other jurisdictions to harmonize their own regulatory approaches with that of the United States and place America in pole position on the international stage for future satellite regulatory activity. More than any other single decision in the regulation of orbital debris, this is the Commission's most significant card to play, and it ought to play it. Third, the Commission should per, uh, parameterize and measure every rule related to orbital debris mitigation, and it should condition future grants to operators on retrospective assessments of their success or failure in meeting orbital debris mitigation benchmarks. 
Right now, orbital debris mitigation plans have an essentially prospective character, but with our reform of the post-mission disposal rule, we have for the first time formally begun to evaluate operating records in the grant of future licenses to operators. This evolution is an unalloyed good. The Commission should move further toward the establishment of operator-neutral parameters for safe space operation, measure, whenever possible, operational success or failure in meeting those parameters, and condition future Commission grants on operating records. Permit me, please, to anticipate and manage a couple of objections. First, the FCC does not have broad authority over orbital debris. Yes, we do. Perhaps you expected a longer answer. Yes, okay, we absolutely <laughs> and very much do. The Commission has asserted its authority over orbital debris for two decades, and for the most part, we haven't heard any complaints. The Commission asserts its authority over far more contested domains quite literally all the time, and yet for 20 years, crickets have chirped in the long regulatory grasses of orbital debris. Second, if the Commission takes the regulatory reins of the commercial satellite market through broad and clear application of its market access authority, the real problems for space economy are Russia, China, and what's perhaps worse, actors who have no present interest in the well-functioning of space, but who do have the capacity to deliver a couple of tons of particulate debris into orbit. This objection, though I hear it often, appears to me to have the character of uh, someone saying, why are you regulating harmful interference between television stations when there's nothing on that I want to watch? There are some things that the Commission cannot and ought not to address, and geopolitics is the non pare exemplar of not my circus, not my monkeys. While I happily grant that the Commission can do nothing regarding how major state actors behave, I don't believe it follows from that that the Commission ought happily to grant market access to any operator that requests it. And of course, orbital debris mitigation capabilities encouraged by our actions would get us farther along in addressing any risks arising from this than we would be otherwise. Third, we should simply wait on international consensus. A couple of reactions to this. First, we may as well wait on Godot. Vladimir and Estragon were at least at one point told that Godot someday would arrive. We have no such assurance of an international consensus with the force of law, and it's already been some time. Second, we will either harmonize other jurisdictions to American leadership in orbital debris regulation or be harmonized in some sense to them. I choose the former, and there is some reason, incidentally, to think that other jurisdictions do too. This is not to say that American leadership in satellite regulation need not be uh, consultative and benevolent. It ought to be. It must be. We have to have consensus from our friends and allies as to what's acceptable. We have to have consensus within the scientific community. But when the Commission waits for domestic consensus as to which organ of government satellite regulation essentially belongs, or international consensus as to which sheaf of best practices ought to be adopted by which body, the space economy continues at pace. Were a serious collision event to happen, or uh, where Kessler syndrome begins to precipitate, the generation to come is not going to thank us for bystander paralysis. So while we must act in consultation with international partners, the operative clause there is, we must act. One final objection is that we should leave it to market actors themselves to self-govern. Well, yes. Absolutely. There are any number of essential functions within the domain, not just of orbital debris mitigation, but of space traffic management broadly, for which commercial actors are perfectly capable of self-governance and may be at the leading edge in capacity to do so. I trust that with minimal poking, commercial satellite operators will arrive at a regularized regime for the sharing of ephemeris data, for example. Governments can serve as a platform for sharing and may even set the broad contours of a framework, but I expect that operators would manage the details because they're at the tip of the technical sphere. Similarly, I expect that operators will work with one another in lowering and raising stations through each other's orbits because they do that today. But even though satellite operators within low Earth orbit are unavoidably connected by considerations that arise from the very fast transit of physical objects that they own through shared physical space, incentives will not always align perfectly. And at any rate, even if you're a good COSIAN and believe that private firms negotiate around rules, first you need some rules. And other than the spasmodic reflect that overregulation, quote, stifled innovation, unquote, I don't hear much from the commercial space sector, other than the occasional heckler's veto, that the Commission should, in fact, sit back and do nothing. Indeed, those same voices rose in protest of the recent evolution of the post-mission disposal timeline, an evolution for which there is nearly universal consensus. The Commission cannot permit itself to be cajoled or wheedled into stasis by perennial malcontents when the moment calls urgently for action. And what's more, I believe that there's broad consensus within the space industry that we should extend our domain here and that doing so in consultation with the space industry will be better for everyone. The telecom sector is in the midst of evolution and revolution. The Commission must evolve along with it. In the regulation of satellites, the Commission has a uniquely free hand, 
and a unique opportunity to influence the space economy for decades to come. Whether we evolve our regulatory model or birth a new one, we must accommodate the material changes to the space sector before the anomalies begin to accrete. Only by bold action can the Commission, enabled by Congress, empower the technical experts and financial depth of the space economy to deliver on the promise that it can be all it can be. So I look forward very much, as I always do, to being further educated by the real experts in this domain who join us here today. Commissioner, thank you very much uh, for those uh, uh, comments uh, that uh, if you think you are uh, blazing a new trail here in Washington by raising these issues. Uh, and today we're very fortunate to have uh, quite possibly the, the leading experts in the world on uh, this topic of space debris. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, introduce them in alphabetical order. Um, um, and then I'm going to ask each of them to uh, offer a few comments, uh, in five minutes or so, and then uh, uh, we'll, I'll follow up with some questions and allow you an opportunity to, to respond to, to their comments. Uh, today we're very uh, uh, pleased to have the, the following uh, experts. Uh, David Goldstein of SpaceX, uh, Moriba Ja of Privateer, uh, Darren McKnight of Leo Labs. Um, David Goldstein is a SpaceX principal engineer in this role, he's an ambassador to government agencies and satellite owner operators on SpaceX satellites. Uh, and he focuses on uh, collision avoidance and space safety. He leads SpaceX's integration with the Space Force's 18th Space Defense Squadron uh, and NASA CARA, and he develops codes and field satellite GNC algorithms. Uh, and Dr. Goldstein graduated from uh, the United States Air Force Academy uh, with a Bachelor's of Science in 1988. He earned a PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, next we have um, uh, Dr. Mariba Ja, co-founder and chief scientist at Privateer Space. As chief scientist, Dr. Ja leads the technical vision for Privateer. He is a renowned space environmentalist and aerodynamicist, specializing in space object detection, tracking, identification, and characterization, as well as spacecraft navigation. He is an associate professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Darren McKnight is currently senior technical fellow at LEO Labs. He leads efforts to realize the value proposition for the growing global network of ground-based radars for space situational awareness. Um, he creates new data depictions, develops risk algorithms, and leads space incident investigations. He is focused on creating new statistical collision risk assessment approaches to provide valuable context to operational collision avoidance support provided by LEO Labs worldwide. Uh, he uh, received his bachelor's degree also from the United States Air Force Academy and his doctorate from the University of Colorado uh, in aerospace engineering science. So let's, uh, let's begin uh, with Dr. Goldstein. Okay, well, thank you um, very much, Harold, and I appreciate the opportunity for, uh, to be able to participate in the, um, in the panel. Um, you know, SpaceX uh, has launched uh, a lot of satellites and uh, and and operate it and are safely operating safely, safely operating them. Um, we uh, we at our at our core um, our company is about space exploration, and so keeping space safe and sustainable is key to the future that um, that we see for space. And so we um, work very hard on ensuring that um, that our satellites operate safely, that we um, effectively coordinate with other owner operators, um, that we build in agility in our satellites to be able to accommodate the space environment, um, but also on the spectrum side to ensure that we 
can interoperate with um, with other systems in an effective way. And so, um, you know, from our perspective, uh, orbital space safety is um, is paramount. And and so, um, all the um, coordination and action that the FCC is proposing um, is very near and dear to to us because um, because you know we we want to to also set the standard for how operators should behave by being transparent with their um, sharing of the, the data that they um, that they create and the data for their satellites um, by being transparent on uh, the number of conjunctions that they have and you know the um, the reporting that we that we do with the FCC that's public um, for others to see uh, and uh, and and also in just in ensuring that we operate in a in a safe and sustainable way. And so uh, we're very committed to it. Um, we work um, incredibly hard at it, and uh, it's it's vitally important to to the company and to um, to the where we want to go in space. And so um, with that, I'll um, uh, pause and uh, yeah, let uh, Mariba or uh, Darren go next. Yeah, Mariba. Yes, uh, thank you and good day to uh, everybody. It's an honor <clears throat> and pleasure to he be here uh, with you and certainly, um, you know, with, with the other panelists. So one of the things that, uh, you know, Privateer is all about is really a company focused on decision intelligence. And what I mean by that is maximizing uh, positive uh, outcomes given a way to manipulate data and information. And so what we're doing in our platform is really trying to aggregate data and information from multiple sources uh, to try to find consistency and the inconsistencies amongst these to pull out insights that otherwise uh, would be hidden uh, without the ability to aggregate you know, all these independent sources of, of evidence and data, mainly, you know, there's some things that we're interested in specifically on this topic for space in the behavior of the anthropogenic or human made space object population and that environment. And so how do we know how things are behaving? Well, if you want to know something, you have to measure it. If you want to understand something, you have to predict it. Prediction is the key. And so, you know, given that we have different ways to measure these things with sensors and people's opinions of of where things are in space and how these things are behaving, including uh, you know, radio communications and, and these sorts of things. And from that, we see uh, patterns in data. And from these patterns, we infer models, but the models that we infer are mired in uncertainty. And that is a big thing that we try to manage. There's a lot of uncertainty about stuff in space. From these models, the models that we infer permit prediction and the difference between what we observe and predict constitutes statistical surprise. And we're really after being very bored and yawning our way through life by being unsurprised. We'd love to predict exactly what we observe, but we just can't get there for a variety of reasons. Um, the sort of decisions that we want to support with Privateer are things that actually help humanity writ large. We understand that all things are interconnected. Mother Earth, Gaia is a system of systems. Land, air, ocean, and space is a system of systems. And these things are interconnected. And evaluating these things in mutual exclusivity makes zero sense whatsoever. We recognize that as a humanity, we are collectively behaving as if we're choosing self-extinction, which makes zero sense. Uh, we recognize that orbital space is not infinite. It's a finite resource and it has a certain amount of carrying capacity along with that. And if people are interacting and participating in this environment without coordination and planning, without talking to each other, just doing what it is that they want, it is definitely going to result in a tragedy of the commons. And we want to avoid that sort of thing. The hardest problem isn't so much technical or political, it's the absence of empathy. And so one of the things that we're after in Privateer is how do we recruit empathy towards solving these problems of space environmentalism and sustainability and linking these to the rest of human activities, again, land, air, and ocean, and being able to provide people insights 
that can help them be safe, keep space sustainable, and help with space security as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. McKnight. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to, to speak on this panel. Um, and um, I will tell you, I'm going to not really talk about Leo Labs. What I'd like to do is focus on what I think I would want to do, Nathan, if I was in your shoes, right? And I think I think there's three main, main, really main things. Number one is this is not a, a U.S. problem alone, right? Any any kind of solution we come up with um, amongst um, the the the, the well-meaning constellation operators in the U.S. Um, are going to be for naught if we don't end up reaching out globally and talking about some very pragmatic issues. Um, I also would um, suggest that you steer away from sustainability. My feeling is enduring space safety gets us sustainability. We need to be safe now, and we need to be, continue to be safe. And if, we, and if we start to be safe, we are going to get sustainability, and I think it's going to be, but it's really getting that non-U.S. Um, contingent involved. And we need to do it not in a way where we're belligerent, like our way is the only way, but to reach out and make that a, really a joint effort. So number, that's number one. Number two, it's very important. I'll talk a lot about operational satellites in a moment, but it's really important to understand the headwinds that all of space commerce has is a result of non-operational objects that have been left up there decades ago. And so I think a lot of people need to understand that we can do everything about debris mitigation, but if we don't have a balanced approach on debris remediation and getting rid of many of these large derelict rocket bodies that have been left in, in clusters, um, yeah, I've been talking about the fact that if you want, want to know what's going on in Earth orbit, you have to look at you have to look at the clusters of dead things, the constellations of live things, and the clouds of fragments. And those three, the interaction of those three really, really are important. And it seems oftentimes people want to focus on one or the other. So you're already hearing one of my themes is we have to stay balanced. Not just U.S., it's global. Not just operational um, constellations but clusters of massive derelict objects and also the clouds of fragments that have been created. The last thing I want to talk about, you've introduced four PhDs on this panel, and guess what? It really is not about the numbers. Really, we need to manage people's expectations. These are very difficult, stochastic, um, nearly random processes that we're trying to predict. In reality, and I know I'll get a, a grin out of Mariba on this, in reality, there's only two probabilities of collision, zero and one. What we really do is we try to calculate our confidence in whether or not it is or isn't going to happen. And so this is in the managing expectations, what we need to realize is people's behavior matters, right? I think a lot of people always want to equate numbers of satellites to level of responsibility. But I'm right now developing a model where we're looking at risk posed and then look at risk abated. And really what we have to look at is that whole balance. If people are gonna put satellites up there, how are they being, are they being created to, to fall out of Earth orbit fairly quickly? Are they being operated to maneuver um, to at a certain level of risk that's lower than everybody else? And are they trying to abate the risk to a level that's lower than everybody else? So it's very easy to go, good, you're maneuverable, but doesn't mean you're operating safely. And so again, I'm going to make I'm going to make Goldie blush here a little bit, but but what SpaceX has done in the hardware, software, and peopleware of space safety really is blazing the trail. Lots of times they get beat up because they have 3,800 operational satellites that that work like a marching band on orbit, right? They are synchronized, they are in tune, they are working hard, and and they actually make the commercial industry better. So our ability to support SpaceX makes us better. And I think it's really important to understand that, that the numbers sometimes, you know, manage expectations of a number, look at behavior and look at the pedigree of how the people are responding, not just what can be in a sheet of paper before you launch, see what they do after they launch. So anyway, so those are my three things, non-US, non-operational, and behavior are, is more important than, than numbers. Thank you. Look forward to the discussion in a few minutes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. McKnight, for those comments. Um, uh, Commissioner Symington, would you like to, to respond to any of those comments? Uh, 
Yes, absolutely. So, um, so uh, maybe I could start with um, with uh, uh, Dr. McKnight's discussion of the different characters um, of specific uh, specific uh, threat objects in space. Now, um, uh, Dr. McKnight is perhaps uh, too modest to mention that Leo Labs has been at the forefront of tracking uh, mid-sized debris in particular. But I think mid-sized debris needs to be foregrounded um, when we start talking about uh, when we start talking about small objects in orbit. Um, mid-sized debris is a new uh, technical uh, tracking capability that only came online in about the, the past two years. And mid-sized debris tracking is therefore not something that's widely reflected in consensus uh, international organization behavior or for that matter, in consensus United States domestic behavior. But for example, I don't believe that mid-sized debris is reported by state or even necessarily tracked by state in its coordination with the space agencies of other countries. Um, so we're faced with a situation where there's a technical capability that's been brought online, at least you know, to, to an extent that's an advance over what was available before, a categorical advance, and that's not yet uh, reflected in the regulatory world. I guess I would say that we see um, a similar phenomenon with LEO satellite coordination. And with LEO satellite coordination, again, there's very, um, there's, uh, there, there's the, the capacity to coordinate large constellations in a way that didn't prior exist, um, because large constellations themselves didn't prior exist. And so companies at the forefront of the contemporary large constellation LEO world, of which, you know, of course, space, uh, SpaceX is the most conspicuous example, um, have been forced to devise new safety standards for themselves in order to ensure that their operations uh, remain functional and that their long-term investments are vindicated. At, at the same time, these are entirely private sector advances that, as of yet, are not reflected in regulatory treatment. So, for example, launching uh, launching into LEO, uh, there's there's no question that gets asked, how well does your constellation play with others? What do your uh, data sharing and coordination capacities look like? Of course, the companies themselves have had to think through these issues and develop linkages, formal and informal, for addressing these. But there's no way for the government to say this uh, this group is a good actor, this is a bad actor, this one is following the best standards, this is following inadequate standards. So, um, so that's a, again another revolutionary um, evolutionary step suggested by uh, new technical capacities and new market developments. I guess finally on the question of sustainability. Um, my agency's statute says that we have to take care of the public interest, necessity, and convenience. And um, regardless of how we define the path to sustainability here, uh, the public clearly has an interest in a space sector that, uh, first of all, does not catastrophically fail. Um, and But then beyond that, one where there's broad social consensus that what we're doing is sustainable and will lead to safe practices. And it's not yet clear to me that the public, uh, which is entitled to expect this, is as of yet able to expect it from what we're able to deliver at the FCC. I say that not to denigrate the FCC, but more to point the point out the urgency that we uh, that we define what constitutes safe and sustainable practices in a way that's um, in a way that's both informed by the cutting edge technical information and knowledge and know how coming out of industry. And on the other hand, is also um, is also broadly defensible to the public interest is to demonstrate that we're acting in fulfillment of our mission. But I'm really just more interested in hearing about uh, new technical developments and getting further education here. So I'm going to cut short before I subject everyone to another long speech. So, so Mr. Sommington, you, you said you were responding to me, so I'll, I'll take the first quick response um, to that. I, I think a couple things I want to mention, and again, it's it's always important, uh, as you mentioned in your in your uh, preamble, that we always uh, are looking forward. And I will tell you that I'm constantly senior technical fellow means I get to go do fun things. I'm not so worried about the always the day to day. So one of the things I'm looking at is how we model things in the future and how we model how well we are abating the risk um, in our constellations. And what was very interesting, and in this will be a paper that will, I'll be presenting in June um, at a conference on orbital capacity modeling. And, and that is that the about 2,500 operational satellites in low Earth orbit that aren't in big constellations, right? That aren't in like the big five are actually posing greater risk 
than, than the two thirds of the operational satellites in low Earth orbit that everybody's uh, scrutinizing on. So in aggregate, 2,500 satellites that may be in groups of 10, 15, 5, 30, um, actually opposing a, a much greater risk to space commerce and is a headwind to sustainability because they're not rising sort of a paying attention to them, but in aggregate, they, they, they cause a significant problem because the risk at which they're going to do a maneuver, their ability to do the maneuver, their investment in getting resources such as collision avoidance services from people like us who are using the, the 18 Space Defense Squadron, um, and the risk at which they want the final result to be are all um, not as high as it is for um, some of their larger operational satellites. Um, so I think, and you mentioned about the smaller size objects, I think what's really important here is that people do understand that the, the hazard from sub 10 centimeter debris, debris that cannot currently be tracked in the public catalog actually poses a greater mission terminating risk than what we spend a lot of time avoiding. Um, and, and one of the things that, that's very important long-term is for us to make sure that that population gets two things. One better characterized, as I said earlier, all models are wrong, some are useful. The LNT, the lethal non-trackable models, really are, are, are very, very suspect. It's very hard to verify them, um, right? And, and so uh, I think it's really important for us to focus on that smaller debris, not just trying to go measure it, but preventing it from occurring by having some of these massive objects collide. So I will, I will mute myself and turn it over to a, another panelist. Comments from, from the other panelists on this? Yeah, my, my only comment um, would go back um, to Commissioner Simonson's um, uh, point, and maybe I misheard, but um, I, I think behaviors of actors in space are observable and can be assessed. And, uh, and, and yes, we, we need to require reporting, but many of our behaviors are very observable um, from the data that's there. And so um, with, with good data mining, I know Darren does a lot of this, with good data mining, you can, you can see um, how uh, effective um, owner operators are at mitigating the risks um, uh, that, that, uh, that their satellites pose. Absolutely, it's um, it, I, it, 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 it's not so much that um, that this is that this is not knowable, but that regulators don't yet have a way of taking into account and and perhaps crediting or debiting uh, companies for uh, for effective uh, management and development of the technology and sharing of information. Instead, we we uh, our current regulatory approach treats each satellite as though it were a discrete risk, which is obviously disincentivizing to large constellations in the first place. So, um, so a model that uh, that takes the coordination capabilities that have in fact been developed and deployed, and that you know, and that as you point out, are um, are in fact observable, and that frankly, you know, the government should be uh, should be studying. Uh, that that seems like the next step in a realistic assessment of space risk that goes beyond the the prior model that we've inherited from the high sparse and large uh, GSO constellations that were once the only uh, only constellations up there. I, I guess the thing that I'd like to um, kind of say to piggyback what uh, you know Darren and 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 uh, you know Goldie have already put out there is that when it comes to you know the evidence of behaviors. Um, I feel that it would be, you know, two things. One, that, yeah, the government should be uh, investing in aggregating all this evidence and, uh, you know, in the presence of uncertainty, being able to um, come up with an assessment uh, of these behaviors. And so, you know, you can't enforce what you don't manage and you can't manage what you don't know and you can't know what you don't measure. So it's all measurements and being able to orient the measurements properly to interpret these, which kind of is my gig. Um, and it's one of the things that I'm trying to get to, but getting a hold of all the evidence um, is extremely difficult. And certainly I believe that the government could be useful in getting some of the evidence into the hands of people such like me to be able to put these things together and you know provide some of these uh, assessments, certainly with government oversight. But I think, um, you know, the second thing uh, 
you know, that I wanted to say is that there has to be transparency in all this other stuff. And the public should be able to have access to the assessments of these behaviors. That's the other thing that I think doesn't make any sense is not being transparent about it. Uh, if you want the public to come on board and be able to support what it is that we're trying to do, then they have to be able to, uh, you know, have access to the evidence in a very transparent way. And, you know, the public is capable of understanding these things. I think humans inherently are intelligent. And I think like, you know, occulting this for whoever knows what reason just doesn't make sense, so. Following up on that, uh, Dr. Ja, uh, uh, can, can you or any of the other panelists uh, discuss, are, are, are there some actors around the world that uh, are, are beyond coordination or uh, perhaps their military or national security reasons that they, they don't want to uh, uh, help coordinate in some way? Well, so, so I'll, say, I'll say a couple of things just based on my own experiences. Um, one, I think that, um, so, so I put hazards and threats into two different categories. To me, a threat is something that has the capability, opportunity, and intent to cause harm. And a hazard is basically something that has the capability and opportunity to cause harm, but not the intent. And the thing is, it's very difficult to measure intent. And usually, usually, uh, because humans don't like to sit in the discomfort of ignorance, we tend to bring our prejudice to get rid of the uncertainty because we don't like sitting in, in, in uncertainty. And uncertainty is my thing. I, I thrive in uncertainty. Um, and so I would say this, right? Um, since we don't have sensors to measure intent, we should bring in social scientists to also weigh in on the data and be able to start understanding the cultural nuances uh, of people who operate in space. You know, uh, some people, uh, the way that they operate, they don't intend to be disruptful, but they, their behavior is. And, you know, if you have the evidence and you can, again, get to the knowledge from the measurements, then you can have some discussions with folks. Let me put it this way. Um, I'm starting to look at ITU compliance and non-compliance here soon. I'm, I'm on a PhD uh, committee of, of Thomas Robert, Roberts at MIT, who's doing some great work in this. One of the things that we're going to see from this is that there are people that are in, in compliance and out of compliance of the ITU regs all the time. Um, and it's the same actors, um, you know, not wanting to maneuver frequently enough uh, because they want to save fuel and these sorts of things. And, and, and being outside of their slots, but you can't know that unless you measure it. Another thing that we've looked at is, uh, you know, looking at who complies or not with, um, you know, registering their objects with uh, UN Office of Outer Space Affairs, for instance. Look, the treaty says register your object as soon as it's practicable. And on average, uh, you know, countries like, I don't know, Spain, just to put it out there, it, it takes them three years to hit send uh, to, to email, you know, you and USA or whatever. My guess is that they're not purposely trying to, to not, uh, you know, whatever, but it's just a practice culturally or whatever. And it's their way to, to interpret the treaty. We have treaties, we have actual behaviors of folks in space. People have different ways to interpret these things and it's not uniform, but it, unless you measure it and aggregate the data and basically can see the salient behavior, you can't have a conversation with these other countries to say, hey, I'm not trying to be accusatory, but it seems that the evidence is this is the way you're behaving. And really, sustainability is humans' ability to utilize a resource in perpetuity. This is getting, this is hindering our ability to utilize space freely in an unhindered way. Can you change your behavior, please, with sugar on top? Then we can kind of see is there intent behind purpose, you know, is there purpose behind acting in these ways or not? But we have to have the evidence to approach people and say, here it is. And the evidence has to be transparent. It just can't be, oh, I have the evidence, but I'm not going to show you and I'm not, I'm not going to put it out there. I'm just going to have these kind of opinions about the way you're behaving kind of thing. And I believe we uh, might be seeing a hand from Dr. McKnight. Okay, please. So, yeah, so so I'm I'm gonna say hallelujah to what Mariba just said. I'm I'm gonna give you a specific instance of that, 
right? Many of you have probably heard when the Chinese space station folks accused uh, Starlink that there were two close approaches that uh, that worried them, right? And and um, we, we immediately were, were were brought on sort of say, do you think these conjunctions are anything to worry about? And from what we could see, they they, they were not. The 18th Space Defense Squadron also concurred they were not. We had an opportunity through Carnegie Institute and Secure World Foundation, the Paris Peace Forum, to speak directly with the folks who operate the Chinese space station. And the story was very simple. If you do not show your work, we can't have a dialogue about if those conjunctions were safe or unsafe. And while I, you, while I said before, you know, we tried to talk about behavior and, and numbers don't matter, at some point you do have to look and say, Tell me what your state vector is. Tell me what your uncertainty was at EPIC. Tell me what your propagated uncertainty was. Tell me what your hard body radius is and what equation are you using to calculate probability of collision? And if you can show me your work, now we can figure out where there's a disconnect. Unfortunately, as Mariba hinted at, there are some cultural issues um, right now between the US and China where that was something they're going to likely want to do. We talked with them about if they shared their propagated ephemeris, um, then, then it would give Starlink an opportunity to, quote unquote, you know, be aware of them and avoid them. In addition, the propagated ephemeris for Starlink was on, uh, on spacetrack.org for them to use. They said, well, we are, can't, we're not allowed to access a U.S. government website. So guess what we did? We have made a public website just for Starlink's propagated ephemeris. Planet said they want to join in too, so Planet is on there, and they, and the Chinese have been told now they can go get that information from a public website, not a U.S. government website. So if so, now they will have information, more information available to them than they did before than they said they had before, and so this is the beginning that we have to really start slowly. And I have to be my physics professor um, hat on here and go show me your work. I'll show you my work. Starlink showed their work and let's move forward. So that is still very difficult from some cultural issues, but we're trying to break that down one step at a time. Yeah, I, I, and, uh, and we, we very much appreciate um, that, you know, whatever we can do to remove the constraints, remove constraints that um, there are internationally. And, and if there are geopolitical ones or there are just, cultural ones, we need to we need to remove those constraints either way. So um, I, I agree with the panelists as well. And if I could just react to this just very briefly, because the, the panel is far more interesting than me, but um, there's, uh, there's always concern when an industry is calling for regulation or greater activity from the government in its sphere of operation, uh, that there may be a risk of regulatory capture. But this is the exact opposite of what I'm hearing here. I'm not hearing any kind of special pleading. In fact, what I am hearing is uh, people with field experience bringing specific uh, problems and specific um, and specific imbalances uh, to the federal government and saying that we need to do more. We need to understand their um, their industry more. We need to publish data uh, to the public more. Uh, imagine, you know, imagine hearing that uh, from from the tobacco industry in the 1960s, right? Imagine hearing <laughs> that from, uh, right? Imagine imagine hearing that from Detroit during the days of the Ford Pinto, not the single out Ford. But um, uh, what I'm saying is, this sounds like the opposite of regulatory capture. Frankly, it sounds like the sector is coming to the federal government asking, please allow us to educate you further. Please collect more information on us. Please publish that information to the public. Please ensure that this common resource can be preserved and can function safely because we know how to do it and we have a laundry list of concerns that we would like to put before the federal government and have action, not in our narrow business interest, but just speaking as scientists, engineers, and responsible parties. So I have to say that that's quite refreshing and um, and it's, it's very encouraging as well. Uh, hopefully, the United States government can get smart by engaging further with uh, with folks in the sector who desperately want to give us information and who desperately want to teach us how to be better at our jobs. Um, but again, I'd like to hand things back to the panel or to uh, Commissioner for Scott Roth, but uh, I felt like I had to say something on that point. 
you know, I think that uh, this is all incredibly uh, insightful. Um, uh, one of Commissioner Symington's uh, recommendations really is that the United States uh, individually take a lead on these issues. Uh, and uh, Dr. McKnight, I think you mentioned that uh, it's important to, to do these things uh, in conjunction with other countries. Um, what is what is the panel's sense of uh, how to, how to move forward on these issues? Is this uh, is this an area where the United States should take a lead, uh, or are there multilateral groups that would be more effective? Uh, I, I will tell you, I'm typically very skeptical of multilateral groups taking a lead on anything, but but perhaps that's not the case in space. I just don't know. I'd be very curious to hear hear what the panel has to say about that. Yeah, um, you know, so one of the, the, the discussions that, um, you know, Goldie and, and Darren and I were, were kind of having before, you know, we started discussions today is, you know, for instance, I am part of the, the National Academy of Sciences has a committee on international security and arms control, the CSAC, and we do have bilats with the US, China, uh, sorry, Russia, China, and um, India on space related stuff. And Carnegie Endowment of International Peace also has kind of bilats. And I can tell you that the track to diplomacy, there's a thing, there's a there there. Being able to work with scientists and engineers and the, the, the people doing that have the trade craft working at the telescopes or the radars and that sort of stuff, being able to work together and do you know international experiments and that sort of stuff, there's a long history of success in that. And I think that has to be promoted and encouraged uh, by the government for sure. Um, in terms of U.S. leadership, I do see that, you know, sometimes people from Europe are like, oh, you know, here's another American led this, that or the other. But I do feel that this is, um, you know, again, orbital space is a yes. finite resource. And, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to get into uh, quabbles about who's leading on being environmentally conscientious. The thing is, we need to do it, and the United States could do it. I would love to see the U.S. government uh, really press on seeing the development of a circular space economy. And what I mean by a circular space economy is one that prioritizes uh, the, the, the mitigation and remediation of pollution in orbital space, uh, wanting to focus on reusable and recyclable rockets and satellites. That's something that we can do. Clearly, the reusable rocket is something that Elon's been able to pull off. So that bravo. Uh, we don't have re reusable or recyclable satellites. So that could be a thing. Um, and for the things that uh, have to be single use satellites, then you know have an active debris removal uh, where people can actually get compensated for uh, you know, deorbiting and cleaning the environment, much like Darren talked about these derelict rocket bodies. That's a no-brainer. We should be able to to start doing that uh, immediately. We don't even we don't have to think about it. Like that's something that the U.S. should should immediately do. And uh, I like putting it in the context of environmentalism and sustainability because we can tie that to economical impact. If we lose the carrying capacity of some of these orbits, we will be unable to get the services and capabilities that these robots in the sky that we call satellites provide on a daily basis. That ability is going to go away unless we do something. So it can be quantified economically, and we should be able to look at waste management principles, develop this circular space economy. The U.S. could lead on that and create a marketplace where third-party organizations like Astroscale or whatever could be compensated for salvaging stuff uh, from space. Goldie? Um, yeah, uh, you know, we we have um, a direct line of communication with uh, with China with respect to their um, their space station. Uh, we we interact with them um, from from time to time. We uh, we we try our best to inform them if a, if a satellite is deorbiting and uh, and we're we're passing within a control box um, that we've negotiated with them. Then, um, then we, you know, we we let them know. Um, they they have started publishing at least uh, t 
TLEs on their on their space station. Uh, it's it's a start. It's um, it, it's good, but it's not sufficient. Uh, you know, with with ISS, they provide um, you know far out look like like weeks of planning with respect to the maneuvers that they're going to do, which allows us to plan our orbit rays into orbit around where where they're going to be. And uh, and we would love to, to be able to have the similar similar data with, with the Chinese with respect to their um, their space station. But um, you know in a, in a in a broader sense we 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 definitely need to have um, the United States as a um, as consistency in the way that we apply our 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 regulations internally before we go and, and tell the world that 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 uh, to that this is the way that we want to do things. You know, um, uh, SpaceX has a lot of uh, there's a lot of requirements on our licensing that that aren't applied to others, and we're we're doing our best to operate in a responsible way, and uh, and we want others to to do that as well, and so. So having similar treatment between us uh, on U.S. licenses and others is the first step to then um, going more broadly and having U.S. leadership um, around the world. Um, so we, we we have to have our house in order, at, you know, at home first before we can go and lead lead others. But but I, I definitely think that we should. And if I could follow up even though Marie Bengali hard to follow, but I'm gonna try. Um, I think the leadership is really an important issue. And I think um, oftentimes people get confused that leadership doesn't mean you're out front saying, do it our way, but sometimes you have to lead from the pack, right? And when you lead from the pack, and I wanna, I wanna commend um, the FCC for looking at changing the, five, the 25 year rule, the post-mission disposal to five years. Um, this is an issue that in the late 1990s, I really felt that NASA and oral debris program really were leaders around the world. And the way you'd lead from lead from the pack is you go out there and say, we're gonna do this, like Goldie said, tell you specifically, get our act together, go out there, and they're not afraid of being the first to do it because they know that the people are gonna follow if you have good reasoning, you have, you've really done your homework. Um, the, 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 the Orbis Act is another great example, right? Um, uh, the folks from Senator Hickenlooper's office um, called us after Chris Kunstler and I put another op-ed out saying, hey, China, Russia, and U.S., you've left a lot of Cold War era mess up there. And, the, and this 21st century space commerce, and I like, I like the term the, the circular space economy, this is gonna, not going to be able to take off unless you clean up your mess. Government-launched government objects left up there. And they have they have taken the bull by the horns and are looking at putting together a very significant package package on the Orbis Act before Russia does, before China does, right? So I do think to show to lead from the pack, I'm going to put some I'm going to put some effort in. It's going to cost me money to do the right thing before disaster occurs. That is really exciting to hear because what Goldie and Mariba and I all agree on is we know people are going to come out of the pack when a disaster occurs in space. We're all trying to prevent that disaster from occurring. We don't want to get an award for preventing a disaster that didn't occur. That would be make us all very happy. Unfortunately, at the current rate of us fiddle faddling with numbers about PC for the big constellations and ignoring the small constellations and ignoring the derelict objects, something massive is going to happen. We're all three going to be on 60 Minutes trying to explain why we didn't warn people. And we can say, we did. And we did. So I applaud the FCC for leaning forward on the PMD. There's many other areas you can lean forward on. And, and um, I think supporting the Orbis Act because we have to do mitigation, space traffic coordination, and debris remediation. And if you can only handle one priority, you're gonna fail. We're gonna fail as, as a global industry if we just wanna find the one thing we can deal with. So anyway, I didn't mean to get on my bully pulpit, but but I feel strongly that that we can lead from the pack. And I think the FCC and Sen Hickenlooper's office are starting to show what we were like in the 90s. And we seem to have lost it because we want to go to the UN and have everybody agree. We're not going to have everybody agree. We're not. Over. You know, um, 
Dr. McKnight, I'm glad you got on the bully pulpit. That's what this is for. You know, we want to uh, we want to hear uh, strong views aired by deep technical experts, and so I'm, I'm, I appreciate that. Um, it occurs to me that that although the rationale for the FCC's leadership here might be clear to me, it's maybe a little less evident to people who are wondering exactly how many rockets the FCC has put into space. And for me, it's quite simple. It's driven by market power. The the United States. Um, has to give a license to anyone who wants to send signals to or from the United States. Since this is satellites, um, and since the United States is a very big satellite data market, um, that means that U.S. licenses are very, very important to satellite companies. And so uh, my, uh, my desire to see the United States lead in this area is pragmatic, because I think the United States is actually the entity that's most poised to take rapid, decisive action. Um, and and also, in doing so, to eat our own dog food and thus lead from the middle of the pack, so to speak, because, uh, of course, there are any requirements that we adopt would be fully applicable to all U.S. domestic companies. And um, my hope is that, uh, that any actions taken by the United States will take advantage of the FCC's jurisdiction, but not by any means be unilateral, and instead use that jurisdiction to bootstrap activities that the national governments and many um, friendly and decent actors would like to see but don't have the market power to deliver themselves. And thus, it's a choice between either the United States delivering something quickly or them trying to put together lobbying and get it done at the ITU, which, you know, as Dr. Jaw noted, um, ITU noncompliance is very often consequence-free. So, uh, so by, having a, by having a direct financial and operational lever over, um, over the, the wallets, of, um, of many space companies, and by consulting with our uh, friends and allies and scientific and neutral stakeholders, um, it's my hope that the United States may become the de facto jurisdiction at which, um, at which everyone meets to get stuff cleared today, rather than needing to resort to consensus formation subject to heckler's vetoes in, interna in international institutions with no enforcement powers. And then on the specific point of, um, of mitigation and removal of existing debris and not merely regulation of new entrants. Um, I definitely feel everyone's pain on that one because uh, we're, we're sort of, you know, we're sort of like a guy who gets to a party in the last five minutes and is asked, you know, why, why are there, you know, sofas on the lawn and, and beer all over the carpet? He said, well, I just got here. Well, you know, maybe, but everyone else left, so now you have to clean it up. doesn't quite seem fair. Um, and I, it seems to me that if we look at um, if we look at the policies that were adopted during President Obama's administration and then continued under President Trump's administration and have now just become consecrated by practice of um, of private uh, private launch development and the revolution in private launch that we've seen since 2008 2009 and the huge amount of uh, new capacities that were frankly not anticipated by many that have come on board whether that's in terms of cost control whether that's in terms of uh, reducing you know by an order of magnitude or more uh, the cost per kilogram of payload, whether that's launch frequency and cadence, whether that's launch safety, whether that's rocket reusability, we've ticked a lot of boxes that, um, that represent a big advance in 15 years. It's my hope that we would be able, uh, through FCC activities, to change the economics on, on uh, active debris removal and passive debris removal and um, to, to find a pathway to commercialization Obviously, there are there are companies out there with pilot projects, and there are national governments out there with pilot projects. But when you look at the timelines and the and the volume of capabilities that they are they would prospectively deliver, those aren't necessarily in line with the needs that I'm hearing from today's panel. So it's my hope that I can uh, continue engaging with today's panelists and with with other experts in this area to get ideas over what the pathway for takeoff, no pun intended, of ADR PDR at a more significant level over the next few years would look like and what role, if any, the FCC has to play in that. But I think I have to defer to uh, Commissioner Firstgott Roth because I'm afraid that we may be uh, coming up against it. Um, any, any final words from our panelists uh, before I wrap things up? Yes. Yeah, so, so look, I guess I just want to follow up <clears throat> uh, on what was just said. Um, I think if the FCC could support or be uh, proactive in doing the following things, it would go to a great length of, of doing what we've all talked about here. One, if you could support the development of sustainability metrics like uh, a carbon footprint uh, analog, but 
in space, call it a space traffic footprint, which kind of quantifies the burden uh, that any given object poses on safety and sustainability of anything else. I'm gonna, you're gonna see that the rocket bodies that you know Darren was talking about have a large space traffic footprint. Uh, so we could quantify it. It's not gonna be in uh, tons of CO2. It'll be some other, uh, it'll be a composite index. And if you put that alongside of orbital carrying capacity, you will see how much capacity is being taken with these derelict rocket bodies and the space traffic footprint that they're actually occupying. And then you can put a bounty on that and you can say, hey, $10,000 to remove this much space traffic footprint and provide this much capacity back. And if we play out the modeling and simulation of these things blowing up or colliding, then you can quantify the detriment and economic impact of losing ability to use that orbit for the things that we use it today. I think doing that and making that very public and transparent, that sort of analysis and, and these sorts of metrics will then usher in this kind of marketplace of uh, people and you know people being able to be salvagers or trash collectors in space and that sort of stuff. We already have something on ISAM, right? In space service assembly and manufacturing, there's already policy on that. But in order to get the technologies up there to do that, I think if you do what I just said, that can definitely provide the, the, the monetization aspect of this because it all boils to money at the end of the day. Well, as an economist, Dr. Zha, I, uh, I very much think that's a brilliant idea and it fits in with your comments about the tragedy of the commons and the solution to that is always to uh, put a price on things and uh, that's exactly what you just described. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, Dr. McKnight, uh, Dr. Goldstein, any, any last comments before I do the wrap? I'll let Goldie go first. Uh, well, I'm just uh, super grateful for the opportunity to be able to take part in this today. Um, we, we do uh, very much appreciate the FCC's leadership uh, on uh, in, in orbital debris and, uh, and with um, increasing, increasing the you know, global um, sustainability of space. And, and, the, and the leadership there is going to be supported by, by SpaceX. And I know that my other panelist members, um, you know, we're, we're excited about the future of space. You know, we, um, we, we look at space as half empty instead of half full. Um, you know, uh, we, we, we do believe that there is still much capacity and much that can be done to, to serve users on the ground in, in, in ways that nobody's ever thought of before and, and be able to provide information around the globe to everyone uh, is, is, is very important to us. And, uh, and the capabilities that can can exist from space that haven't even been thought of, um, you know, we're really excited about that future. And so, you know, space is half empty, not half full. Um, that's the thing I would leave you with today. So, leveraging what both Goldie and Amariba said, I, I'm, and and focusing on something specific, because again, I think it's always good to end on a specific. I mentioned to you, I'm working on a modeling paper that'll be out the first week in June. I'm and, and I want to talk about it again real quickly, because what Mariba said about sort of the bounty, um, we are putting in this paper. And so uh, many of you may be aware of this object years, object metric ton year uh, metric that had been um, submitted and then actually applied um, on some of the licensing things of late. Um, clearly, we believe that that metric is a great idea. The threshold needs to be vetted more. And that's all, that's all in public record. In the paper that we're doing, what we're actually doing is looking at several different models. Remember, all models are wrong, some are useful. Looking at three different models, and one of them looking at the object metric ton years with the idea of if a constellation has a requirement, but they go up and in the deploying a satellite, they take out other people's dead things and they get a credit, right? And then that's going to then enable either that constellation or other people to then come in and grab other objects and then sell it back to other constellations, what you'll end up doing is a net, you know, it's kind of like hiking up, take out what you bring in, right? But you take out other people's things, you get, you get, you get a rebate for that. And so we actually have a quantifiable examination of that in this paper we're putting out the first week in June. And we didn't do this in a vacuum. We've been working very closely with, with both um, SpaceX and with 
one web, two major constellations at different places in low Earth orbit, right? They might have very differing ideas about the metrics and working with them to make sure that, that, that we're not doing a, a very um, um, sterile approach to this, but really something that would be make sense operationally, because that's exactly what we're doing, sort of an FCC public rulemaking in a paper. And so what we hope to get to you all in June is, is, is an attempt for us to take a look at some very specific issues um, about um, how we, the devil's in the details, right? And if the devil's, in, but if you do it right, you might be able to make this self-licking ice cream cone Mariba just talked about, right? Let's go get people to go grab it. And all of a sudden, goodness comes because you reinforce good behavior, but you do it by setting some clear standards and, and admitting that, that we did make a mess before. You know, I love, I love Commissioner Somington, the, the couch and the, the dirty couch and the beer balls all over the place. I need to clean up that mess. Well, we have that problem. And, and I, I see this as, as the, 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 the space is three quarters empty, not just half empty, three quarters empty if people start to, uh, to act responsibly. So, so hopefully this, um, this dialogue will help some people get encouraged that good things can happen, it's all, all bad. And again, we applaud the FCC for having this forum and for pressing forward hard on the, on the five-year rule. So thank you. Well, thank you. I think uh, with uh, the leadership of uh, this panel and Commissioner Symington and the FCC, then uh, things, uh, things can be looking up. Uh, and uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for participating today. Uh, I, I just want to close with uh, expanding on Dr. Jha's comments about uh, being uh, boring and unsurprising. Uh, the, this conversation today has, has been neither boring nor unsurprising, but we hope the future that uh, all of you are working on will, will in fact be boring and unsurprising in space. Thank you all very much. Thank you.